Good evening and welcome to the May 5th, 2022 Parks and Rec Commission regular video meeting. I'm Peter Strzok, Park and Rec's Vice Chair. Chair McCarthy is traveling and asked me to run the meeting this evening. In accordance with Proclamation 20-28.10 and the Governor's extended, extended Safe Start Order, tonight's Parks and Rec Commission meeting is using video conferencing technology provided by Zoom. The Zoom video of this meeting is being recorded and will broadcast live via Zoom and will be uploaded to the city's YouTube channel later this evening. City staff and consultant guests are participating in tonight's meeting remotely. Other public audience members are listening to the meeting by telephone or via the internet. Welcome to all and thank you for joining us tonight. <clears throat> Commissioners, please turn on your microphones. Will the city staff please call the roll? Chair McCarthy. Vice Chair Strzok. Here. Commissioner Cohen. Here. Commissioner Birkenwall. Here. Commissioner Westberg. Here. Commissioner Markson. Here. And Commissioner Bursey. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioners, before we start the business of tonight's meeting, I want to suggest a few rules to help the meeting run smoothly. If a commissioner has a question, please use the <clears throat> raise hand feature. I will do my best to recognize commissioners in the order in which hands are raised. Everyone will be asked to limit himself or herself to one question and to one clarifying question if necessary, so that each commissioner has a chance to ask a question before a commissioner is given another chance to ask a question. Additionally, prior to speaking, please state your name for those listening in on the meeting. Tonight's agenda will not include in-person appearances in accordance with Proclamation 20-28.11 and the governor's extended, extended safe start order. However, individuals wishing to speak live during the appearances portion of our meeting may do so by telephone or by using the Zoom teleconferencing application. Provided, however, they registered their desire to speak with the city administration staff by 4 p.m. today. Our city admin staff will call on you by name or telephone number when it is your turn to speak. <clears throat> city staff, is there anyone who has signed up for appearances that wishes to address the commission tonight? No, there is not. Okay, so with that, we will move on to our agenda for the uh, evening. And we'll start with the uh, department report and we'll wel welcome recreation manager, Mr. Ryan Daly. Good evening. And I'm sorry, I had to step away for just a second. We did, perfect, we're in line. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Too many notes around here. Allow me to share my screen one second. Let me know if you're seeing anything better looking than me. Of course, we tested this. There it is. Anything? Is that showing up for you? Yes. Luther Burbank? Yep. Perfect. Let me shuffle some items around here. There we go. Okay, fingers crossed this advances. All right, um, just wanna give an update on the Mercerdale playground. Uh, this won't be much of an update. I'm sure many of you uh, felt the chill of April uh, and that did not help our cause with this project. Uh, the contractor needs ongoing temperatures above 45 degrees for about four days straight, uh, as well as no rain. And as you can tell, today is not working out for that. Um, and that's to be able to pour in that pour in place surfacing. Um, otherwise, everything else is done out there. Our team uh, and contractors have, have prepared the area. So it's really just a waiting game at this point. Uh, we are maintaining the Let's Talk page. Uh, and that link is shown here. 
Uh, we are getting some phone calls uh, from, from community members who are um, asking questions regarding when they'll be able to use the playground. And so we are uh, continuing to share that, that information with them. Uh, we have had some challenges with uh, people who are just unable to avoid the allure of that new playground. And so we're uh, continuing to, to keep a safe environment out there with fencing uh, and managing that, that location. So more information, hopefully, to come very soon. Good news. Uh, the Mercer Room is back up and running. Uh, that means we have begun hosting events uh, and have a number of them in the queue for, for this spring and going into the summer. Uh, we updated the room's audio-visual um, which was done during the closure. So that, that's sort of a fresh new look for us. Uh, and we'll be installing new flooring here in the coming weeks. So it's, it's really exciting uh, for this facility to really be back to offering uh, what we were offering pre-pandemic. Uh, and the response from the community has been just great. Uh, maybe overwhelming at times for, for our staff uh, with the rental inquiry. So it's a really good position for us to be in. Yesterday, we had the opportunity uh, to welcome back the Mercer Island Rotary Club for their luncheon. Uh, this is an ongoing rental twice a month, uh, and it just feels really good to be returning to that normalcy I, I talked about earlier. And, and you know what? It tastes good as well. That uh, leftover cake from Rotary was just the lunch that, that some of our staff needed. So we're really excited to have that, that room and that amenity back up and running. Uh, if you are interested in, in renting the facility or you know people who are, please, please do forward them to... Uh, the website below, which includes all of our uh, rental information. Summer celebration. Uh, you are going to see this slide every month until summer celebration uh, hits. And we're, we're very excited. This is our largest event since 2018. Uh, and really not only is the staff and community excited, but, but so are our sponsors. We had um, three sponsors step up immediately in the Mercer Island Windermere uh, Recology and the Mercer Island Community Fund uh, to support this event. And that just, that just means so much to us and I think the community by them just immediately stepping forward to, to support. So additional opportunities are out there. We, we can use every bit of help uh, to support this event. And that website on the slide is the best location to go uh, to find ways to support. Speaking of events, uh, we have a mostly music in the park lineup. So please mark your calendars. Uh, unfortunately, last year we were only to do able to do one of the, uh, the scheduled events. It went extremely well, but the pandemic held us down a bit. Um, the, the opportunity we do have is coming forward in July and August. Uh, and just another shout out to the community fund. They're supporting this event as well. They're a primary sponsor for this event. Uh, and quite frankly, it couldn't happen without their support. So again, thank you to them. And uh, the lineup is posted on the uh, website listed there. And we are finishing up a booking on the August 11th date. So we'll be releasing that very soon. Uh, no, North Mercer Island Enatai sewer upgrade. Uh, some of, there's a lot of text on this slide, so I will not read it. Uh, but as many of you know, the King County crews are using parts of the boat launch uh, for this project, staging. Uh, they have equipment and materials that are located there. Uh, and they'll be upgrading a, lar a significant amount of that pipeline, about four miles. Uh, the contractors will, they'll also be staging at an area uh, owned by WashDOT uh, just, just up the hill from uh, the boat launch. And so once those, once the project is complete, uh, the areas will be restored to their original condition. Uh, I do want to point out that the uh, impact of parking will be significant. We are communicating with all of our uh, individuals looking to purchase a boat launch pass so that they're fully informed of, of what those impacts will be. Uh, so we're out front on that communication element and our website is, is updated as well. So for more information specific to the project, please visit the uh, kingcounty.gov website and you will find additional information there. And please don't freeze. There we go. Uh, Aubrey Davis Picnic Shelter. 
Uh, you may recall that the picnic shelter was badly damaged by a fire. Uh, we've been working with our insurance authority as well as contractors uh, to update or to restore the facility. It's looking really good. It's beginning to take shape. We anticipate this to be wrapped up later this month. Uh, and when that's complete, we'll be able to move forward with our online booking process that uh, has been really successful at those other uh, shelters and picnic areas that we offer. So the, the information is included there uh, with the uh, website down below. Whoa, uh, Saturday was a busy day at the community center. Uh, lots of kids, lots of sticky fingers, uh, lots of fun. Uh, we have a great partnership, as you're well aware, with, with the Mercer Island Preschool Association. Uh, and last weekend really highlights that, that mutual, mutually beneficial relationship that we, that we share. Uh, our estimate is that we had about 1,000 people attend the circus, uh, which included a touch-a-truck, uh, which were city vehicles, petting zoo, uh, and so much more. There was games in the, in the gym, and there were lots of brownies, uh, Lots of cotton candy, lots of food in general. Went very well. It was exciting for our staff. It was uh, energizing, I think, for our staff to, to work that event and work side by side with the volunteers from MIPA. Uh, so again, another, another huge thank you to them, as well as to our city staff. Uh, we had a number of staff give up their Saturday to work this event, including police, fire, our public works team with the touch a truck event, as well as the parks maintenance crew. Uh, and then of course our recreation staff who was on site as well. KCLS update. Uh, I just received earlier today uh, a response to our email we previously sent. So I wanted to include just a, a quick snippet. I haven't had a chance to review all of the uh, response and I'll be forwarding that on to the, to the commission probably tomorrow. Uh, but just a couple of updates are uh, in library programming has, has relaunched uh, as of April and they'll be expanding at all of their locations. Uh, the library meeting rooms are going to be open uh, effective yesterday uh, on May 4th. And then KCLS, you know, talking about how they're engaging the community. And I think that's been a question for the, for the Parks Commission. They routinely engage through surveys uh, and community input. Uh, so some recent examples were a 2016 strategic planning process and 2019 uh, survey as well. Uh, currently, they are planning another survey uh, and working to determine what the what the best time frame to launch that is. I think a lot of us understand the, the challenges the pandemic has, has pro I don't want to say provided challenges, but it has. Uh, and so we're working or we'll be conducting some, some interaction with KCLS to, to help inform uh, what that time frame might look like. And I think the, the commission will definitely engage in that conversation. With that, I thank you and I will stop sharing and pass it back to you, Commissioner Strzok or Vice Chair Strzok. Oh, oh Peter, you're on mute, sorry. Thank you. Uh, the first item of regular business is to review and consider approving the minutes from the April 7th, 2022 meeting. Commissioners, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the April 7th meeting? I move we approve, this Commissioner Westberg, I move we approve the minutes from the um, uh, April 4th meeting. April 7th. April 7th meeting, sorry. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Don Cohen, I'll second. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, there is a motion by Commissioner Westberg and a second by Commissioner Cohn. Commissioners, does anyone have any questions or comments before we vote? Uh, seeing none, commissioners, please turn on your microphones and will city staff please conduct a roll call vote? Chair McCarthy? Aye. Vice Chair Strzok? Aye. Commissioner Cohen? Aye. Commissioner Birkenwald? Aye. Commissioner Westberg? Aye. Commissioner Markson? 
Aye. Commissioner Bursty. Okay, motion passes and the minutes are approved. <clears throat> The second item of regular business is to review and consider approving the minutes from the April 26th, 2022 special meeting. Commissioners, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the April 26th, 2022 special meeting? Don't be shy. I'll do it. This is uh, Commissioner Marks and I. Let's see, hopefully I say it right. A motion to approve the minutes from the April 26th special meeting. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, this is Commissioner Westberg. I'll second the motion. Thank you again. So there is a motion by Commissioner Markson and a second by Commissioner Westberg. Commissioners, does anyone have any questions or comments before we vote? Again, seeing none, commissioners, please turn on your microphones and will city staff please conduct a roll call vote. Chair McCarthy. Vice Chair Strzok. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Birkenwald. Aye. Commissioner Westberg. Aye. Commissioner Markson. Aye. And Commissioner Bursty. Motion passes and the minutes are approved. <clears throat> the third item of regular business tonight is the athletic facilities allocation and use policy. We welcome back recreation manager, Ryan Daly. <clears throat> Good evening once again. Uh, Dave Setterland will be bringing forward the, the presentation right now. So I'll ask him to uh, pop onto the screen. There we go. And as, as Dave brings that forward, Dave is our recreation coordinator who oversees our uh, outdoor facilities, uh, outdoor athletic fields, uh, picnic shelters, all of, all of the like. And so Dave will be running us through this presentation. Uh, he'll be joined by Chris DeLon, uh, who is our recreation facilities supervisor and provides oversight of the community center as well as all uh, exterior facilities. So with that, Dave, I will pass it off to you. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> and thank you, commissioners, for allowing me the opportunity to speak here this evening. Um, tonight, I'll walk through the updated athletic facilities allocation and use policy. I'm happy to entertain any questions, suggestions, and input along the way. <clears throat> Uh, tonight's agenda, first we'll do a little background and some history of the policy. Uh, we'll review user group engagement and how we uh, reached out to our, our users. Uh, we'll touch on policy elements and updates to those policies. And uh, we'll also, at the end of this presentation, ask for your endorsement of the policy. Uh, this is the first time that the updated athletic facility and allocation policy has come before the PRC. Staff has talked about the policy in big, broad terms as we went through the reset strategy and more specifically during the MICEC facility allocation policy uh, development process. <clears throat> um, a little bit of the history and the engagement, it, it all started in 91 with the establishment of the ball field user group, uh, known internally as the bug group. Uh, the bug group coordinated schedules and reported back to the city uh, their needs. In 08, this model was updated but stayed largely intact. In 2016, the city underwent a year-long process with a consultant and stakeholders to establish a priority order and a transparent process. Uh, now, our intention is to update their 2016 policy to bring in alignment with current policies. Uh, knowing where Updating the policy, we engaged our users uh, starting in December of 2021 at a staff introductory meeting. Uh, we told the users about implementing policy updates. Uh, April of this year, we sent users from the past three years a uh, draft policy and solicited their feedback, as well as invited them to this uh, tonight's meeting. Uh, staff engages regularly with field users and has a good understanding of their concerns. Most of their concerns revolve around the procedures rather than the policy side of things. 
So that's our background in, in engagement. <clears throat> While creating or developing this update, the first thing that struck me was the demand of our facilities. With over 6,000 hours of field rentals in 2021, it was obvious that the facilities are a huge resource for our community, but also the fields are finite. And as such, it's, it's important for staff to strike the right balance to maximize our resources while also protecting it. So we sought to do this by aligning uh, and updating our policy by incorporating our four macro guiding principles, uh, which you can see here on the right hand side of the screen, um, as well as incorporate our division goals. By aligning our policies and creating consistency, consistency and clarity um, throughout the process, it, it helps not only users, but staff, staff alike. <clears throat> Two major policy questions we had. One, should user groups be differentiated for priority use? Our staff recommendation, yes. Based on residency, age, and nonprofit status, we feel we can create a fair and equitable allocation process. Uh, second question, should use by any one user be limited to uh, accommodate other users? Again, our staff recommendation, yes, based on considerations used to establish fair and reliable allocation. <clears throat> the updated policy considerations as well as the guiding principles allow for the scheduler to create a benefit-focused allocation for the community uh, that support diverse use and that is fair and equitable. So policy elements that we identified that we were gonna look at were one priority order, uh, two consideration of fair and reliable access. You know, staff wants users in good standing to feel comfortable in returning to the fields uh, now their level of access may fluctuate year to year, uh, but we want them to feel comfortable throughout the process. Uh, the inclusion of our outdoor athletic facilities, and then also we sought to align, the, align with other division policies. So you might be asking, well, what's, what's changed? What are the updates? And uh, the four updates are one, the inclusion of the guiding principles. This allows for the policy to be fair and equitable. Um, two is the inclusion of the athletic facilities under one policy. This policy uh, will be a clearinghouse for all outdoor facilities, bringing all facilities under one umbrella. Third, uh, we're creating consistency with all division policies. Hopefully you noticed this as you read through the updated draft policy, as it looks similar to policies that you've already endorsed, and for the removal of procedures from the policy as it made it tough to decipher the policy from the procedures. Uh, moving on to the procedures, I would like to introduce uh, Recreation Supervisor Chris Along. Chris will be speaking on the procedures. Thanks, Dave. Um, when we talk about our procedures for our outdoor facilities, I think that historically, uh, many of our biggest challenges have come on the procedural side from both our user groups and our staff. Um, although the commission is not being asked to advise on specific procedures, uh, staff would like to carry forward support from the commission on reaffirming those procedures as we establish them with our user groups. Uh, this will allow our staff to reach our goals. Uh, those goals are communicating clear expectations to our users um, executing efficient booking processes and providing accountability for both staff and our user groups. Um, next steps for us, when we talk about our next steps, staff will be uh, continuing to engage our user groups to help develop and inform our procedures moving forward. And we'll, and we'll provide implementation uh, that helps us achieve the outcomes that we want to see from the policy. Uh, so those are the steps that will be taken moving forward procedurally. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to Dave to kind of wrap things up here. Thank you, Chris. Um, staff recommendations. 
Robin, uh, that you can move to endorse the athletic facility allocation and use policy, as well as move to support staff establishing and reaffirming uh, procedures for athletic facility allocation and use. And with that said, we can open it up to uh, questions, concerns, uh, and I'll stop sharing. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cohn has his hand up. Yes, thank you, Don Cohen. I have two questions, actually. The first one is, could one of you sort of give an example, real world, uh, you live with this stuff, I don't, real world example of how you would apply these policies when there were conflicting or apparently conflicting requests? Well, what did you give us, give us a couple of examples just to give some context to it, to me at least. Sure, absolutely. So um, with this, you know, we often have some conflicting sharing of, of uh, fields. Um, I think the first thing we would do is we would look at our policy as a filter, right? And we would, you know, say, look at our allocation, offer the allocation off to, um, you know, you have to excuse me. So I think I want to get to the, the root of your question is if they're conflicting. And I think there we would have to look at um, uh, historic use. We would go to our considerations, right? And we would look at our historic use. Our historic use wouldn't be a be all end all, but that'd be something we'd consider. And then we would look at safety. Um, it, would it be a confliction with, with safety? Um, so that, that's, how, that's how I would address it at first. Uh, without having like an actual conflicting policy, I, I, I feel like I might be leaving you a little bit in the lurch there, Don. I, well, what I, what I, thank you. What, what I, that's helpful. But what I'm, what I'm kind of looking for is what's an example that, that you, of why you need a policy at all to okay. deal with this? Give me a real world example. You don't, I don't care about your uh, restating the guiding principles and so forth, because I've read that, I heard it, I appreciate that. But I want, I want a couple of examples of here is, here are examples of when this policy would come into play. So this policy clearly states the priority allocation. And so the use of this policy is only for a very short period in time. And what it does is it allows our, you know, people that fall in that priority allocation. So whether it's uh, a local resident, a youth group, a nonprofit, they get to be, um, you know, kind of first, first in line. After the, uh, after the priority, that, that no longer is the case and it's first come first serve. So what we're using that for is to uh, keep an eye out or keep a lending hand out for, for our local community and making sure that they have uh, the advantages moving forward. Now they can choose to or not to uh, request the priority. I, I hope maybe that was more succinct or gets to the that, question. Yeah, that helps a little bit. Because what would be, uh, just one more follow-up on this one, what would be examples? So I, I'm making this one up, but tell me if this is something right. Uh, yeah. a, a user group from Issaquah wants to use a ball field, mm -hmm. but we have a Mercer Island 75% group, uh, either uh, youth or adults. Yeah. So, so that's, is that the kind of example that you've run into over the years? Y yes, exactly. That, that'd be exactly it. So, you know, you would see our, you know, during that priority allocation, the group from Issaquah, the group from, you, you name the town in Mercer Island, they would all submit. And then according to our allocation process, we would use that as a filter and give first um, right to our 75% local user. And then we would work down that priority list using it as a filter. And once we get our, you know, our 75% youth nonprofit in there, then we move down to, you know, the next, the next, the next. And then that is a quad group will get their, their priority. Um, Okay. So thank, hopefully thank, that's yeah. Thank thank you. I I appreciate it. Uh, I'm I may my questions may sound naive, but I'm not a ball player, and I and a, or a, uh, and so I personally haven't run into this. I know a lot of people have. So thank you. I'll hold my other question because maybe it'll be answered by some other people's comments. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Commissioner Westberg, please.
Commissioner, you're muted. I just had a quick follow up uh, to Don's question uh, and, and more for my own clarification, but uh, in the packet we got, it contained a, the department's athletic field use and reservation policy. So that's, that I assume is the policy that's in place now, is that correct? Yes, correct. That's the, that's the 2016 policy that we're working off of to update. Okay, so and that policy outlines it, it reaffirmed the priorities that that we have in front of us in this new policy, but it indicated that for scheduling purposes, you group by you group by season and by sport. Correct. Uh, and you have a scheduling calendar and forgive me because I don't I haven't engaged with this personally myself so I don't know the process exactly but so. You receive applications uh, all at once based on a scheduled date for for the sport and for the season, correct? And yes, then sir. and then you're in a position to sit down and evaluate each of those requests at the same time. So you can relatively easily sort through and pick out the ones that are tier one, tier two, tier three, et cetera. And, and develop your schedule that way sort of all at once for the season. Is that, am I, yes, am that's I correct. correct in assuming that that's the way you do it? Yes, that's the process. Okay, so you can, in that process, and you can quickly make that decision between a Mercer Island group and an Issaquah group or something like that and, and schedule them accordingly. Correct. Okay. I would add to that, um, Commissioner, that as soon as that date where the priority you know ends then it becomes first come first serve so you know there there's a there's a there's a window in time where that's the process where we sit down and we use the uh, allocation process as a filter and we go Mercer Island you know we move everything around and, and allocate it appropriately and then once that is over the date comes then we we move on to first come first serve Okay, and so just a quick follow up then. So then how do you handle first come first serve requests as far as that same tier, uh, four tier priority system? So their requests should already be submitted in it. If I could, if I could add to that. Okay. So once that, we'll call it the deadline. Mm -hmm. So you have your priority period, you hit that deadline, then, then staff is working to maximize field usage. And, and really focus on our cost recovery model. So it could be any user group, essentially any user group coming forward would then receive the same level of priority. Oftentimes it is our local groups adding on periodically, but we do see some of those more um, regional or even for-profit groups uh, coming forward and requesting field time. And that's where their opportunity starts. So uh, the real benefit to this policy is if you're a, a Mercer Island group and you're a nonprofit and you're 75% residency, you have a real leg up on the competition from off island. That's not the case in all cities though. Um, we feel like it's a little bit unique here to put that emphasis uh, on, those, on those local groups. And uh, just, to, just to follow up, Ryan, this is Commissioner Westberg. And then, so those first come first serve groups, they, they just get slotted in wherever you have a gap. And Correct. Basically, basically, they have to live with what's available. Correct. And, okay. and I would add to that, this is part of our, um, you know, as we look at optimizing our services, and I'm, I'm getting a little bit into the process here, and I apologize. Uh, but this is where some of our online components with our software and our efficiencies are really going to come into play, is if we can get everyone getting their um, priority bookings in early, it allows for a real staff efficiency in the end to maximize the access to the facilities. And that could be for either those priority groups or the, uh, the non-priority groups. Okay, Commissioner Cohen. Yes, uh, my second question was, uh, what are the examples of the procedures that the second motion is being asked uh, the commission to support? I, I understand you pulled some of them out of the old policy, but 
I, I'm always a little bit wary about voting to support something that I know nothing about. I understand that staff, there's benefit for staff to have some discretion in implementing these things. But at the moment, because I'm not familiar with this stuff, I have no idea what you're talking about on the second motion. I will, I will reach out on this one ahead of Dave and, and Chris and, and just share uh, some of my experience over the last couple of years. Um, allocating space for fields, allocating the space is, is relatively a simple process. You, you put in your application uh, during that time period, staff reviews, and we move forward. That's the ideal world. The actual practice that we've seen uh, has been uh, blanket booking, which is when you uh, submit a whole list of dates and then you turn them back later, that becomes a real challenge. And when we've tried to, uh, we've gotten out of practice in the past of, it, of holding groups accountable to that time uh, or to providing us the detail that we need to book the fields effectively. Uh, what we're asking the commission is to recognize that that's an issue that's a, uh, a drain on staff resources, a significant drain, I might add, uh, and that we need to work with our user groups and reaffirm those procedures, those core deadlines that will be in place uh, that hold them accountable to that priority level, but also doesn't allow our fields to sit vacant or unused, booked or unbooked uh, during those periods of time. And that's, that's maybe what the um, crux of the challenge that we've, we've felt on our field time here on Mercer Island has been uh, the, the failure to adhere to some of those processes. And that, that also goes along with uh, when payments are due. Uh, we would like to collect those immediately or work with the groups and, and having them uh, follow through at times in making their payments is extremely difficult. Uh, and when they don't make their payments, dropping them out of that priority group is, is an extremely uh, impactful uh, aspect to, to their organizations. So we want to work with them to set up procedures that work both for them as well as the city and keep us accountable to our policies, our financial policies, uh, namely. Uh, thank you, Ryan. This is Don Cohen again. Uh, can one of you show me the second motion, proposed motion again? Because I think I have a follow-up question based on what you just said, Ryan. Or just read it to me. I know it's short. That's fine. I don't have it in front of me. I'd be happy to read it. This is Dave Sutterland. Uh, move to support staff establishing and reaffirming procedures for athletic facility allocation and use. Okay, so I thank you. I'll ask a question that we've had asked before in other contexts. Why, why do you need the Parks and Rec Commission to pass that motion? We're, you, we, we're uh, being asked to endorse uh, the policies. We're a policy uh, focused body and staff is the implementation body. So I guess I'm asking what's the, what's the reason that you need number two? Excellent question. Uh, our rationale is that this demonstrates support from the body moving forward for the work we're going to be doing. Uh, this is going to be, it may be impactful to some groups who um, don't follow the procedures. Uh, and what, what I would like to reaffirm from the commission is that it is our goal to hold steady and that the commission does support staff work in this element. Well, when you, uh, this Don Cohen again, I mean, you you typically see in uh, in ordinances and things like that where you'll have a policy adopted and then say, and the commission or the council uh, charges staff with uh, adopting procedures uh, to implement the policy, something like that. Is this just a little stronger way of saying that? Is that what you're saying? This this I, is a this is. I mean, a... Let me say, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to have the commission be in the position of. When, uh, when staff adopts some procedure that is not to somebody's liking mm -hmm. and, and staff says, oh, well, you know what? The commission said we could do this. And as a very general proposition, that may be true. I guess, I guess my rebuttal would be, uh, we will be asked, why Ryan, are you just making up these policies? And, and, and we're really vetting why 
the and that's the key aspect here is the why this is important and it's it's to benefit all user groups and it's to to hold not only the user groups accountable but also staff and so that's what we're recognizing through the through the supporting motion and and i would encourage the the commission to discuss that as well okay thank you uh council member reynolds yeah i, I apologize if i'm just being slow on the uptake and getting this but um if i run a non-profit youth-based organization for that is entirely Mercer Island residents. Can I submit an application and claim every single field for the entire season? What what stops me from doing that? Commissioner, thank you for your question. So in theory, yes, you could do that. However, um, you'll see one of our two uh, major policy questions. One was that, that very thing. And so what we have in place um, our considerations, as well as our, uh, our guiding principles. And so our guiding principles tell us, you know, is it fair and equitable? Is it, you know, a diverse use, right? And so those things tell us right off the bat that one, it's not fair and equitable if one user is getting all the fields. Two, it's not diverse because it's the same type of use. And so there's a mechanism that allows the field scheduler to, to say, hey, this doesn't seem fair and equitable, right? And so, yes, because you are priority and you do have that high rate, you will get a number of fields and, uh, and, and you will get those fields ahead of others. However, we will hold back some fields because we feel that it's not appropriate for one user to dominate all fields for a season. So, so the guidance to actually say, you know, what share I can take is, is that going to be part of your procedures that are not necessarily part of the policy? Is that correct? Yeah, that, that is definitely correct. Okay. And then one other quick one, if I can sneak one in. Um, I, I'm worried about a, a perhaps a couple of ambiguities in the policy, or maybe it's intentional. Um, I think about like my daughters were big, big uh, athletes. And if they're playing on a soccer team where the team is all Mercer Island residents, but the club that has teams all over Puget Sound has people that are not Mercer Island residents. Is it the team or the organization that determines priority? That's a great question. So I can jump in on that, Dave. It, it would be the it would be the organization booking. However, if it was a specific Mercer Island team, that would be something we would work through. And that's that's sort of where you see the flexibility and we want we're really focused primarily on the needs of, of the community first and foremost and recognizing those. So that would be in a, an evaluation process that our scheduler would go through. Okay, thanks. Okay, this is uh, Vice Chair Strzok. I think I'm gonna just take a quick turn here. Um, first uh, suggestion on the, um, in the policy on the second page, after you go through the priority access, the tier A, B, and C, or one, yeah, A, B, C, D, and so forth. Then you get down to the uh, what you call considerations. A is historic use, B, C. The question, uh, I guess I don't see a C there. Interesting. I guess you got to read it. <laughs> um, the question I have is, are those supposed to, the A, B, C, that, that designation, is that supposed to signify priority or importance? So you, when you get a, a conflict, you're going to say, first, we're going to look at historic use and safety and so forth, or is it really all these factors are, are somewhat equal and it just depends on the situation? Excellent question. And it's it's why we didn't number them. Uh, they all play a, a factor and, and there is a, um, a diverse balancing act on um, what goes where and how that's factored in. A historical use for us in the past has, has maybe been a challenge. Uh, you've had some of those organizations that historically have dominated in field space uh, that's really limited new organizations who fit the same criteria from emerging and and stepping forward. And so that's that's why it's one of the considerations. It's not a uh, it's not the steps of the filter necessarily because there is quite a bit of um, human evaluation here to to see what actually makes sense uh, in implementing the usage or the the opportunities for usage. Okay, thank you for that. My suggestion that would be to would be to eliminate A, B, C, so forth, and just use bullets, so there's no uh, ambiguity. Because I took that as A, B, C as being 
ranked order um, for, for your consideration. Uh, and then if I can do a follow-up to uh, Commissioner Cohen's comment about the second motion, where we say support staff establishing and reaffirming procedures when, where we, we've talked about, them, but we really haven't seen them. And I was just wondering uh, from a language standpoint, if we said, if this helps at all, may I have a motion to support staff establishing updated procedures rather than reaffirming? Because that kind of puts everything in the future. Yeah, you're gonna take a lot from the past, but it kind of leaves it a little bit more of an open book. Um, anyway, that, that would be my thought there. I, I appreciate that suggestion. I, staff would yeah, be supportive okay. of that. All right. Um, go to Commissioner Westberg. <clears throat> this is Commissioner Westberg. Thanks, uh, Peter. Um, that kind of addresses what, what I was going to say as a follow up to uh, Don's question because, uh, I mean, are the procedures, it seems to me what you're saying is we have these 2016 procedures and they're pretty good. We follow them they're pretty complete and we follow them. But well, no, the difficulty has been they have not always been followed, um, at least you know, in, a, in a consistent and disciplined way. So that the actual procedures that, that you're talking about may look very much like what you placed in front of us. But what you're really asking for is for us to support a more consistent and disciplined approach to applying them is that, is that correct? I, I think that, that's an accurate statement, Commissioner. I, I, I agree with you. I think the other part of our, um, the procedural element is the changes in technology that we're seeing now and how we actually go through some of these booking processes, how we accept payments. There's, there's a lot of detail there that I won't get into, um, but I, I appreciate your statements that you're making on um, more so looking at the previous procedures and committing to them and committing to the, to the future uh, development as well, or enhancements, I should say. Well, it, just as a quick follow up, in any event, I said, I think Peter's idea is excellent as far as changing the wording of that motion. So it just, whether you adopt the procedures you already have, or you tweak them to add new ones that reflect the technology, I think that's, we would certainly encourage that and then encourage that they would be applied consistently. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the commissioners or council member? I, uh, Don Cohen, I have one. Uh, okay. I, I, I support the uh, change of wording that uh, Peter recommended. Uh, the second, the last thing was a question I had. And this is again because I'm not a ball player, or a ball field user. Is the term uh, not competitive or non-competitive? Does everybody understand what that means? Who wants to uh, rent one of these outdoor facilities? Dave, I would defer to you. What's it mean? Let's just put it that way. I think it's fairly straightforward. I, I think a competitive need would be one that post tryouts, one that they um, maybe uh, turn away people from playing. Uh, Non-competitive league, I think we seek one that where, you know, if Don, if you, if you signed up, they, they let you play on the team, even though you don't have any experience with, as opposed to maybe another team that would make you try out and not allow you to play. So I, there is a little ambiguity there and you could certainly tighten it up, but I, I think it's fairly straightforward and, and people um, in the ball field world would, would, would get that. Yeah, and there the was, contrary, I'm sorry. Well, there, sorry, was, a, there was a separate one that said, uh, that referred to tryouts, right? So it's, uh, so yeah. I, when, I, when I read non-competitive, I thought, wait a minute, what are they talking about? You just go out and practice or something like that, but you don't have any games against somebody else? That can't be what it was, right? I think it means they lose all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about my playing career, council member, um, I, I would say I, it, it's sort of referenced in item five there uh, under definitions with recreation based uh, being non-competitive. And, and the way that's viewed is and, and fairly consistently across user groups is uh, recreation bases is, is your typical record. It's Little League. It's uh, your youth soccer programs that don't cut. Uh, everybody participates. When you get into the competitive program, that's your uh, maybe more elite type programs. And that's, that's pretty, 
pretty commonly understood. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Markson. Thank you, it's Commissioner Markson. I had two questions. Um, I, it was around that recreation-based um, statement. And I'm just a little confused because I, I'm picturing like high school and middle school teams. And I know some of them use Island Crest Park. And I know that some of them are tryout, which um, anyway, I'm picturing like the baseball program, for example, which I think we want to support. Well, I assume we don't want to say that they can't use the field or they're not priority. So where do they fit in this? Or are we yeah. saying that? Maybe. Commissioner, I can, I can give you a little bit of a pretty good example here. Um, so first off, any school district usage is tier one. So it falls in line with the parks and recreation. So they're, they're a tier one. So your high school softball team, your uh, high school baseball team, your middle school track team, all of those fall into that. But, but where you see the 75% okay. uh, recreational, what you oftentimes have is, and I'll, I'll use our boys and girls club as a, as a tremendous example, because I think they do it right. Um, they primarily provide recreational based baseball program. Everybody gets to play. Everybody gets an opportunity. They also have a couple of what we consider select teams, which are competitive teams where those, those players looking for a little bit more, get that opportunity. Uh, what this position, what this um, policy allows for is that opportunity still, because they're primarily a recreational based organization, but they're offering that little bit extra uh, for maybe those more elite players. So I, I hope that kind of answers the, the question for you. Yeah. You know what I realized is that I didn't see A as part of the tier. <laughs> so I was looking just at tier one as the first thing. So now once you said that, it makes sense. Okay. And I apologize. We skip um, past that quite often <laughs> because it's that, it's, <laughs> it's that different tier. It's like a given. Okay. The, the super tier. Um, yeah. <laughs> the super tier. Okay. I thought, I figured it was something like that. Okay, the second question, um, oh my gosh, no, I might've just forgotten it. <laughs> um, oh, I know what it was. Uh, and this is not, maybe this is on the procedure side. It's not really a policy question, but how, like will, I know one of the goals that I read, maybe it was in the old procedures now was to, or you just stated a little while ago, you want to maximize use of the fields, right? Not have them open. So once you fill out all the people in the priority groups, then you'll open it up to others. And I'm wondering if there's like one of your web services is going to be that they can, people can get on and see what the availability is, or do they have to call and reserve? I'll, I'll speak long term for for us there on that one, Commissioner. Uh, I think you're reading where we want to go. Uh, we're we're exploring okay. what those opportunities are because, and I, I shouldn't speak for Dave, but I will a little bit. He spends a great deal of time reviewing open vacancies on our fields and trying to plug and play where. Okay, you're this group. Maybe we can get you here. Oh shoot, lacrosse is here spends a lot of time doing that. And if we can cut that down, and we're working on this also with the community center uh, to be able to uh, view that and save a lot of staff time as well as it just makes it so much easier on the user group. So that I think you're, you're headed in the right direction with, with where our minds are going. Okay, thank you. And I would, I would just add that that is part of our um, transparency piece is we do want the community to know who's using their fields and uh, are they resident groups? Are they non-resident? And, and we can kind of balance that. That's gonna be helpful information when this commission reviews this, hopefully reviews this policy uh, in the next year or two. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, last call for questions or comments. Okay. Uh, seeing none, um, so we have uh, two motions, um, and the first one would be a motion to endorse the athletic facilities allocation and use policy, and I, I'll just add uh, with this, with the kind of 
slight change that we would take the considerations and just use bullet points as opposed to a ranking of ABC with, I think that was the only change we were gonna make. So if somebody wanted to make that motion. Uh, this is Commissioner Westberg, I so move. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Marks and I second that. Thank you. So there's a motion by Commissioner Westberg and a second by Commissioner Markson. If you, commissioners, if you would turn on your microphones, will staff please, city staff please conduct a roll call vote. Chair McCarthy. Vice Chair Strzok. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. <laughs> Commissioner Birkenwald. Aye. Commissioner Westberg. Aye. Commissioner Markson. Aye. Commissioner Burstein. Okay, thank you. Motion passes. Uh, the second motion, um, since I made a suggestion, I, actually I'll, I'll make, make the motion. And it'll, the way it'll read is uh, to support staff establishing updated procedures for athletic facility allocation and use. Is there a second to that motion? Stan Cohen, I'll second it. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a motion by Vice Chair Strzok and a second by Commissioner Cohn. <clears throat> Commissioners, again, please turn on your microphones and will the city staff please conduct a roll call? Chair McCarthy. Vice Chair Strzok. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Birkenwald. Aye. Sorry. Aye. Commissioner Westberg. Aye. Commissioner Markson. Aye. Commissioner Burstein. Motion passes. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving to the fourth item of regular business tonight is the King County Library System presentation review. And we welcome back Recreation Manager Ryan Daly for some opening comments. Thank you, Vice Chair, Ryan Daly, Recreation Manager again. Um, I, I don't have much to update on the, on the KCLS. Uh, questions that we put forth, as I mentioned in the department report earlier. Uh, but if you'll recall, at our last meeting, we were uh, discussing the presentation we received back in March. Uh, and we're discussing what, what potential next steps we have uh, as a commission. And so I just want to share where, where staff uh, maybe sits in this conversation. Uh, we're not currently prepared to add any work plan items that would include uh, additional engagement or um, developing surveys or, or things of maybe that nature. Uh, but we are, and I think this may be a good spot for the, the commission to really discuss how can we provide a more or an opportunity for a forum for the public to share their, their input and how do we want to convey that uh, to KCLS. So. Uh, with those opening comments, I will uh, pass it back to you, Vice Chair Strzok. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, <clears throat> so, to, to, to be as productive as possible on this on this matter, um, I thought of three possible options we could we could move forward tonight with. First, we could uh, <clears throat> decide that because KCL, I guess, just uh, sent the information today, we really haven't had a chance to digest any of it that we could just postpone this discussion until a future meeting and you and and kind of take it up at that point so that that's one option a second option would be just to kind of have a, what i would call a general kind of whiteboard type discussion of what ideas we think that the prc should um consider you know monitoring attracting as it relates to the library and our relationship with kcls and then the third option I thought about was to, you know, form a two or three person uh, subcommittee or not even not a subcommittee, just an ad hoc discussion group that would really work with staff to produce, I'm going to call a draft document that would try to outline specifically what issues we'd want to try to tackle or discuss and, and equally important kind of a process how to move forward. Um, and with this idea, 
we could just ask commissioners first if they want to be involved with this kind of small discussion group to produce a draft. Um, but all commissioners could then just submit written suggestions over the next, you know, two or three weeks. Um, and then the group would get together, the ad hoc group would get together and try to put into a kind of a document that we could read. And then at a, at a future meeting, we could use that document to kind of work off of and try to hone our, uh, hone down exactly what, what we want to do with regard to, to KCLS. Um, I'm open to any one of the three. I don't know if people have any strong uh, opinions one way or the other. Commissioner Cohn. Uh, Don Cohn, I don't know if this is a strong opinion, but where would the potential idea of the uh, library issues really not being part of the Parks and Rec Commission responsibility on an ongoing basis, whether it means going back to forming a library, but where would where would that fit in? Is that something this small task force would uh, might consider? Because I still have trouble grasping. I know Sarah knows a lot more about this. She served on the old board, but but I, I still have trouble figuring out why libraries are parks or why they're calling them recreation. Yes, part of it's recreation, but but it's so much deeper than that. So I'm uh, anyway, I just wonder where is that a separate uh, is that a fourth thing that we could do uh, pass a motion to explore uh, the, you know, or engage with the city council and city manager on whether uh, a separate library board should be uh, formed or what I, I guess I don't want to lose sight of that as at least as a possibility. Okay, that that's that's I, I my initial reaction just jumping in would be that that could be part of of option three of this kind of uh, ad hoc working document to kind of say we we talked about these various issues and you know one outcome would be to you know go back to city council and suggest that there be a separate library board or something to that effect. Um, uh, Commissioner Birkenwald. Yeah, I would just say, I don't really think there's enough. You know, there's a lot of information that the library provides to you, but I really don't know if there's enough for a whole board to be doing. And I think that's why it was subsumed under this commission. Um, so that was, that's my takeaway. I don't know why it ended up being under Parks and Rec, but, um, but I would say there's really, I mean, <laughs> it was just a lot of them updating us on what the library's doing, but there were really no decision. We never made any decisions. It was just information coming at us. So, um, you know, I think it's fine to look at it again, but I, I, that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Council Member Reynolds if he has any kind of thoughts on I know, I know that kind of the collapse of the library board, I think was before your tenure, but if you had any. Yeah, I, I've chatted with the city manager about this briefly in the past and I've forgotten exactly what she said, but I think the general impression I had was the idea that was similar to what uh, uh, Mr. Birkenwald said, that there's just not a lot necessarily for the board to do. And it certainly takes a fair amount of staff resources to continue to service of a, 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 a board or a commission. So I, I think there was a hope to, you know, kind of combine it somewhere else for the sake of efficiency. And I, I think I'm sympathetic to that position. Um, I'm not sure that Parks and Rec is the obvious place for it to be, but I'm not sure where else to put it. It's probably as good here as anywhere else. But I, I think if you guys felt strongly that it needs to be spun off and council would sure consider it. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Westberg. Um, I think we should put it under the utility board myself, but uh, that's just an idea. Um, <laughs> it is kind of a utility, you know. <laughs> it is. Um, no, I think you know. I think the 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 board looking at some of that background material, the the board sort of arose when uh, the city was having a very definite disagreement with um, the King County Library System over the proposed remodeling of the library and didn't really feel that King County was, was listening uh, to us. And um, so that's gotten resolved. And then 
you know, things were, were going along, like Sarah said, it was a lot of disinformation sharing. And then, uh, then the pandemic hit and that resulted in the library closure, it resulted in major changes in procedure and programming, some of which are coming back. Um, my own feeling is, Peter, based on your three, the three things that you're outlining, I'd, I'd kind of like to digest the, the additional information that KCLS is, uh, as, a, as a board, as a commission, digest that additional information and then maybe have that discussion about are there key issues arising from that that, that we think uh, would rise to the level of somehow organizing better, whether it be a um, you know, working group to, to flesh out those issues or whether it would be a permanent subcommittee of this group or something like that, or even reestablishing another board. But I don't, I don't yet personally know what those issues would be um, to move forward with. So I, th I think I need some more information. <clears throat> OK. Anybody else have any uh, thoughts on that? Uh, Commissioner Birkenwald again. Sarah? Sorry, I didn't put my hand down, I apologize. Oh, okay, all right, thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, hearing uh, no other uh, suggestions, um, I, you know, personally, I'm f fine with uh, the suggestion that we digest this information and and uh, <clears throat> and then kind of see see where we go forward. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think I think that yeah, I think there's a there's a lot to learn from from KCLS, and then we can kind of better define exactly what we need to do uh, uh, how how that goes. So so maybe Ryan, I use from a timing perspective. Uh, you had mentioned that you just received the email or uh, and I, did, did they answer all of the questions you asked or we asked or is it just kind of a partial response? It looks like I, I honestly have not read the full email yet. I apologize. Um, there's information in there it, for sure. It's um, I can't really speak to it because I've got it about that big on my other screen. So um, mm -hmm. I'd like to send it off to the commission. Uh, have you guys review the input that they provided and and maybe it's best to take next steps from there uh, with council or with commission leadership uh, deciding what date might be good to put another another conversation on the uh, planning schedule. Okay. Does that uh, that sounds fine to me let's let's just plan plan to do it that way and and uh, review things. Okay. And, and um, this, this Don Cohn and, the, and yep. the public would have a chance to engage in that process at an appropriate time. Also, I, I see some comments on the chat here from somebody who's watching, and it suggests that at least some people feel that they would like to be heard more by uh, the library. So, yeah, and I, I think in that regard, um, you know, at, at the, the whenever the, the meeting is that we're going to discuss the this data and so forth, maybe it's June. I don't know. We'll we'll have to look to staff for that. But I think I think it'll be good to publicize to the community, and that they can then you know opine because it'll be in the agenda packet and so forth. If if I could quickly respond, Ryan, daily recreation manager. Uh, there's reference to a report. There's there's no report. It, we asked like five or six questions, and and that's pretty much. Uh, the extent and it was a, a lot around engagement so what staff would do uh, ahead of that meeting is compile it into a staff report uh, that answers some of those questions and is um, readable by the by the commission and maybe provides a recommendation on the direction um, we may want to go so i just wanted to be clear about what what we should be expecting and it's it's fairly limited at this point mr markson Um, actually, I think Ryan just answered my question. I was trying to make sure I knew what Rose reminded what questions. And this is ones we sent at the end of April to the. Okay. Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let me see here. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
I believe that that is the last item on our agenda, our regular agenda. Um, I think we're going to look at uh, commission reports and work plan, uh, or or uh, work pl or planning schedule updates and so forth. So um, maybe if any commissioners have anything to report for the good of the order, please raise your hand. Oh, Commissioner Markson. Well. Um... I'll just say thank you for putting sand around the trails and around Ellis Pond. <laughs> it made my dog walks much more pleasant <laughs> over the last few months. So anyway, that was it. Thanks. It has been a wet one. <laughs> okay. I d uh, Ryan. Chair, if I if I might just touch on the planning schedule, just just very yes, very briefly, uh, we don't have any necessary updates. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, we did have an item five, I believe, on on this agenda originally. It was the 2021 uh, Recreation Division Annual Report. We're still compiling that information. It'll be included in your uh, gosh June. We're saying June now, June packet, which is just next month. Uh, so we'll be having that conversation uh, then, as well as uh, an update on 2022 services and projected services for 23-24, which would be uh, presented to the city council. Additionally, that June 2nd meeting is a joint meeting with the Arts Council. Uh, the only change that we were talking about was we were going to provide an update on the Climate Action Plan with uh, Ross Freeman. That won't be coming forward at this meeting, uh, but it will be at, at subsequent meetings when there will be input uh, requested from the commission. Okay, thank you for that. Commissioner Cohn. Uh, Ryan, this is Don Cohn. Ryan, when would uh, the city council be considering the motions we passed last time regarding the bike skills area? Excellent question. Uh, it is slated for the, the uh, allocation request is slated for the 17th of May. Is the, let me, let me just ask, make sure I'm clear. So the allocation request, there'd only be an allocation if the, uh, if they agreed with the recommendations or, or modified them that there's something to allocate for? <laughs> correct, very, very so, correct. So, yes. so, they, so will council, council will be discussing whether uh, what we uh, recommended is the direction they want to go. And if so, then the allocation, whatever that may be, the 75,000 or whatever it is. Yeah. Correct. Yes. And that may inform additional steps. Uh, if, if something were to come back to the Parks and Recreation Commission or something along those lines, uh, council would have that authority to kick something back also. And I assume that that, would, that, that will be publicized in whatever way that the city normally would publicize things. And I'm sure that people are keeping an eye on that. Absolutely. And the, and the Let's Talk page will be updated as well, which many are following right now. And I did report it during council member reports on Tuesday this week. So the council knows that this was your recommendation, but at this point it may not go much further than that since at that time of night, I'm not sure many people are watching. Thank you. Um, Ryan, this is uh, Vice Chair Struck. One other thought I had, um, going kind of going back to the library issue. Um, at the beginning in, in your report, you know, you had like KCLS that told you like they're going to be reopening the community rooms on May 4th. I'm just, think, I'm just thinking that whatever the uh, two or three of those items are um, that probably are of general interest to the community, you, you might want to use the either the Mercer Island, if appropriate, the e-newsletter or something like that, just to kind of alert, because I think, um, this, I, I don't know how many uh, people are on kind of the, the KCLS mailing list that would know that stuff. Excellent point. And uh, I think you're, you're highlighting one of the uh, aspects I'd like to work with the commission on about you know, how do we want to receive information from KCLS? Uh, and I need to work with our communications manager about how we're publicizing that also. And so I think this is a, 
there's opportunity here to uh, expand our reach uh, from the city standpoint. And, and I think that could also be reciprocated uh, from KCLS's standpoint for, for some of our programming items. Uh, so I think there's, there's a relationship to build and expand upon here. Uh, yes, I would agree 100% there. Okay. So seeing uh, no other uh, hands, uh, <clears throat> we will move to adjournment and the next Parks and Rec Commission meeting is a joint meeting with the Arts Council on June 2nd, 2022, at, starting at 5.30 p.m. The time is now 6.45 p.m. and the meeting is adjourned. However, as a reminder to commissioners, please stay seated until the city staff has terminated the Zoom broadcast. Good evening and stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much.